Eagles Entertainment. Hi, Eagles everywhere, and welcome to the Eagles Insider Podcast, presented by Lincoln Financial Group. I'm Eagles Insider Dave Spadaro. We are all coming off an extraordinarily difficult weekend, one across the United States, around the world, filled with protests, with violence, with emotion. So we are not tone deaf to that in the least, but we are trying to provide a distraction for you. You love the Philadelphia Eagles. We love the Philadelphia Eagles. And the Eagles Insider Podcast continues on this Monday. So let's turn our focus to the 2020 season. Last week, the NFL had another virtual meeting. And during the course of this meeting with owners, some rules were put into place for the 2020 season. And here to talk about those rules and explain them to us, the Eagles Vice President of Football Operations and Compliance, John Ferrari. Hi, John. Dave, how you doing, my friend? I'm good. You staying safe there, pal? I am staying safe, um, and I've missed you during this quarantine. Yes, well, uh, hopefully we'll see each other soon. It's been uh, an extraordinary time, very difficult 2020 for everyone. Let's just not forget, we are still in the midst of a pandemic, so everyone, please be safe and healthy out there. John, with an eye toward 2020, uh, we do are we are all very hopeful for a season. There are some rules that have been put into place. Uh, there are some rules that we hoped would have been put into place that have not quite gotten there yet. So let's let's clear it all up right here. And I really thank you for your time. Um, I guess the first order of business is to talk about what is new for 2020 and the approved playing rules. Number one, uh, introduced I guess by the Philadelphia Eagles to amend Rule 15. Section 2, which makes permanent the use of uh, and the expansion of automatic replay reviews to include scoring plays and turnovers negated by a foul and by any successful or unsuccessful try attempt. Put that into English for us, please. Yes. Okay. So, first of all, as we talk about these, I just want to say off the bat that, you know, Jeffrey Lurie and Howie Roseman and Doug Peterson, the leadership, are so key as we propose rules, as we fine-tune rules, as we uh, analyze existing rules. You know, those guys are really so on top of this and so empowering to, um, to you know, let me look at a lot of this stuff that, you know, I, you know, we couldn't do this without their leadership. So that's the first thing I wanted to say about this. So, the, the automatic reviews that you just referred to, those two things. So the, they got added in 2019 to the menu of plays that are automatically reviewed. So that's successful or unsuccessful two-point tries and scoring plays or turnovers that are negated by a foul. And they got added last year to the menu of automatically reviewed plays in the the same rule change that made pass interference reviewable. So pass interference got reviewable. And then those two things got added. They got added in one proposal. So, and it was for one year only, as you know. So I was concerned because we proposed the Denver proposed the automatic review of the two point tries. And we proposed the automatic review of scoring plays negated by foul uh, last year. And it got approved and it was competition committee was nine zero in favor of it. And it, it was a no brainer, but it got lumped in with pass interference. So it only became a one year change. So because it was important to us last year that, Coaches have full information. The, the whole purpose behind this rule change is to give a coach full information before he has to accept or decline a foul. And I'll give you the example. Okay, it's fourth down, and the offense completes the, a pass for a first down, and there's a penalty on the offense. Well, that coach, that catch needs to be looked at. Do we have a first down or do we have a turnover on downs? before that coach is either going to – that coach on defense would accept or decline that penalty. If it's an incomplete pass and it's a turnover on downs, I'm going to decline the foul and I'm going to take possession of the ball. So what we want to do there is just give a coach full information before he has to accept or decline that foul. We got that in 2019. It was for one year only. And I just wanted to make sure that in the wash of pass interference – that those two changes, Denver's excellent suggestion and our suggestion from last year, didn't get lost in the shuffle. So we went from – so the proposal was – there was no change from the 2019 uh, language. It was just to make the one-year experiment of those two components of last year's proposal 
permanent. Excellent. And what kind of case study was used in two, from the 2019 season? Did we see um, that the rule was the corrected a lot of potential errors or clarified decision making for coaches in there the were, in the advent of two point conversions? That's a great question. There were two relevant plays actually over over 252 games. There were two relevant plays in terms of uh, that where the review changed the the coach's decision to accept or decline. Now, here's the thing. The, this doesn't add any time to the game, right? There's not a, this most scoring plays and turnovers are review are, are confirmed, you know, within seconds of them happening because they're very clear that they, but the ones that would stop the game, the ones that would, would put the decision-making of the coach into question um, those still, those will, will get looked at further. So, um, yeah, there were only two in 2019. There were more in 2018, 2017 when we, uh, the, when we looked at things for the 2019 change, when we looked at those prior years. Um, so there were only two across the game, but listen, it's a, it is, it, it's one of those things where it's, you know, and people complain about the length of the rule book, but you put these things in, just in case, and you're covered in the event that these situations do come up. All righty. Very good. Okay, so number two here, uh, by the competition committee, expands defenseless, defenseless player protection to a kickoff or punt returner who is in possession of the ball but who has not had time to avoid or ward off the impending contact of an opponent. So, in other words, this is giving a punt return man, a kick return man, an opportunity to, I don't know, for lack of a better word, just kind of create some, some, some room before he gets potentially, you know, really hit hard. Is that kind of yeah, the way it looks? That's it. And, and every year the committee and the, the player health and safety groups at the league office, they look at player safety fouls. So every year you're going to see something in the in the realm of player safety added to the rule book now really this change really practically it, there, it's not really a change at all what it does is it aligns the rule book with the way the play is officiated okay defenseless play, uh, the returner while he has that halo around him is considered defenseless okay similar to a receiver making a catch he needs to he, just because he's contacting the ball doesn't mean he's no longer defenseless just because he has control of the ball doesn't mean he's no longer defenseless. He has to be able to protect himself. So in this case, you give, and this is what the official philosophy was, and this is where this rule came from, you give that player the time or the ability to ward off that, that, that contact and, and defend, theoretically have that ability to defend himself. So you're going to see the, but you're always going to see these players' safety fouls, especially when that's the way they're being officiated or the way they're being treated to align the rule with what they believe is the correct officiating philosophy of how to handle those plays. Do you have the information on you, John, that over the last couple of years here, the, uh, the enforcement, the implementation of these new rules designed to uh, enhance player safety, specifically kick return game, the kicking game, um, how much is that reduced player injuries, player concussions? Is it a significant reduction? I don't have the exact data in front of me, but the from from when they instituted the new kickoff rules in 2018, so we've had two years under the new kickoff rules, there's been a significant decline in head injuries on those kickoff plays, which was exactly what the purpose was. So I so, so I don't have that exact number, um, but it's been a significant drop off in that. So that's really what that – that was always what the goal was. Yeah, and in just a bit we'll talk about the one rule that did not get through that perhaps would have certainly added some intrigue and maybe it comes back at some point, but an, introdu an introduction by the Philadelphia Eagles that we'll talk about in a moment that didn't pass this time, but we are hopeful for passing in the future. And I'm not sure fans really understand how often it happens by the competition committee. Uh, this prevents teams from manipulating the game clock by committing multiple dead ball fouls while the clock is running. So you can't uh, extend, uh, keep the clock running by just, sitting on the football, taking the air of the football. Is that kind of the gist of it? Yes. So, and, and what we're talking about is, is multiple fouls um, that would prevent the snap outside of five minutes. Inside, I think, I think most fans know that 
the a, a foul or a uh, a play out of bounds. The clock doesn't wind inside two minutes of the first half or inside five minutes of the second half. Right. At the end, of, sorry, the five minutes, uh, two minutes of the second quarter and five minutes of the fourth quarter. Right. I think most fans know that, but outside of five minutes, which is where you've seen what the what this is, what the loophole that this is intended to create, a team with a big lead has an incentive if they view themselves as playing more against the clock than the opponent, they have an incentive to bleed time off the clock. So you saw this early in the season last year with New England, uh, did it against the Jets. They took, and it was fourth down. It wasn't close. They were in punt formation. They took a delay a game. Now, two successive delays a game by rule would have been on sports for my conduct. So New England lined up again, and they didn't take a second delay a game. They took a false start. So technically... They didn't, they didn't commit on sportsmanlike conduct, so they got to run it. So they ran a 40-second clock off as they lined up for the punt. Then they took another 25 seconds after the first foul was enforced. Then they took a second 25 seconds after the second foul was enforced. So that's what this rule was intended to prohibit. Later in the season, um, I think it was in Week 17, Tennessee did it, and then Tennessee did it in the postseason against New England. Um, when they have, were playing with a lead in the fourth quarter. So really the times you see it are, you know, seven minutes or so in the, when the, 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 the team with the lead feels comfortable. Um, I believe that Tennessee New England game was a little closer than, than you'd like to see the intentional burning of clock, but um, you would see it outside of five minutes in the fourth quarter. You can't do that anymore. You do it and the clock's going to start on the snap. So there's no reason to take that, that intentional foul, you know, and clearly, you know, in these situations, the clock's more important than the yardage. So the team doesn't care about taking the five-yard penalty. We're going to punt the ball anyway. We'll take 10 yards of penalty enforcement for 40, in that case, 50 seconds, two 25-second clocks worth of the game clock. That's worth it to them. Yeah. Um, comp- to competition committee said that's not what we want. We want to see guys playing football. We don't want to see teams taking intentional fouls to manipulate the game clock. All right. So that's your summary of the approved 2020 playing rules. Uh, There is one bylaw that has been approved for 2020, so let's discuss that. The league office increases the number of players that may be designated for return from two to three from the injured list, incorporates interpretations applicable to bye weeks during the regular season and the postseason. So teams may designate three players for return during the course of the 2020 season. How significant is that rule, John? It was previously two. Uh, the past couple of years, it's been two. Before that, it was none. You couldn't. When a guy went on IR, he was lost for the season. Now, uh, we used we had the ability to bring back two. Now, you, we, first of all, it was one. Then it was two. Now it's three. Listen, I think this is, you know, when you have star players who are lost for the season, it's exciting for fans, the idea that, you know, teams can get better later in the season by bringing guys back. And it is gives teams greater roster flexibility to know that, you know, my starting defensive tackle is going to come back later in the season. Um, and, you know, I have the possibility of bringing guys back. I think it, you know, for players too, when players are on injured reserve, I'm not, I think most people fans know this, they're still getting paid their salary when they're on injured reserve. Um, but I think what this does now is, and I mean, and this was, this is true really uh, when, when you had two guys, when you had, the ability to bring guys back and not have them have to stay on injured reserve all year, you know, guys rehab with a sense of purpose that, you know, I'm not rehabbing for the next season. I'm rehabbing for this season. And I think that really is help their trainers and helps our doctors. Um, it's good for the players. So it gives you greater roster flexibility to go from two to three. I'm pretty sure. I don't know this for a fact, but I think that was a unanimous vote. So, um, since they changed that roster rule to to permit those IR players to return the same year, it's been positive for the league. A question about the roster, and I, I may have asked you this last year. I, I always want to know the answer to this question. Why, and especially now with a spring, uh, the OTAs gone, we hope training camp goes off without a hitch. We hope the regular season begins on time. We don't know that. But why are teams not permitted to have a full complement of players on game day and instead have to designate what now to 48 players on game days rather than the 50. What, what, what is the roster change now? 55 players now? 55. Yeah. You know why Dave, it's a competitive equity thing. So the idea has always been, uh, and, and maybe it's outmoded. I think that in a lot of cases it's not, but I think the idea is that, you know, team a 
um, has 53 healthy players and team B has 50 healthy players. Well, all of a sudden, and so team B can only dress 50 guys because of those injuries to those three guys. So all of a sudden you're in a situation and you can, you can play that any number. So, that, so, you, so you get a situation because of injuries where you have an uneven number of healthy players, right? So, but at the same time, you don't want to have to put those players on IR to, in order to field 53. I don't want to, if a guy's going to miss a week, I don't want to put him on IR. Um, so we, um, in order to match up with my opponents, 53 for that week. So you have a down list for that week. Well, I, yeah, I, you know, my, my argument would be, Hey, that's just part of your, you know, your ability to get your players back. And that's just the way it goes. If I'm healthier than you, then kudos to me. I hear you. I hear you. Uh, I think, and I, and I think in a lot of cases that, that I, I, I agree with you. I think that all, I do think that, having that flexibility, being able to put a guy down for the week and have him be available to us next week and not have to use a longer term roster de- designation um, simply because I'm playing a numbers game. And I think my opponent this week has three more healthy players than I do. You, we know that you're going to have a certain number of guys down. Um, I, I, it, it's, it's sort of the way we think about the, the, the roster, the, the game day roster decisions on that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I see what you're saying. I do get your point. Yeah. Uh, no worries. So let's talk about the rule that the Eagles proposed. You got a lot of would... ide- you got a, you got a lot of ideas, Dave. You should maybe John, go to I, the I, league office. Well, hey, listen, you're my liaison to the league office. I think that this is how we <laughs> how great how great beginnings uh, start here. Um, let, let's talk about the, 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 the proposed onside kick. The Eagles propose that if an offensive team wants to twice a game. It's, uh, instead of kicking off or onside kick, uh, an offensive team that it perhaps is trailing or could be leading would have a fourth and 15 play at their own 25 yard line. And if you convert that play, you keep the football. If you don't, the other team gets the ball at the spot. That's the gist of the rule proposal. That's the gist of the rule proposal. And let me give you a little history of it. It was, it was first adopted in the AAF, the, the short lived league. Um, that was headed by Bill Polian, and it was it was first adopted and experimented with in the AAF, um, and it was it was interesting and it's successful and people liked its application in the AAF. And then last year, Denver proposed a variation on what we proposed this year. It was it was in that it was in the world. Um, it was, but it was a little different. And then the league did a study of it, and then the league experimented with it, and they had it in the game at the Pro Bowl this past year. So it had been vetted by a full league, you know, granted a league that only uh, was in in existence for a year by another club and then by the league and then put in, into practice at the Pro Bowl. So it had had some legs there. Um, and so we took a look at what Denver had put in with the AAF and how they had applied it. And then also the league's own research and put together our proposal. And then before the, vote we amended the proposal based on some feedback from the competition committee some conversations with officials um and you know some officials had some really good feedback on it because when you get into a situation like this and i think there's a lot of unintended consequences and whenever you're thinking about the rule book you have to you know something might appear obvious at the outset oh this just this is this is better but then there's unintended consequences so when you are thinking about something like this, you have to think about dead ball fouls on a scoring play that would normally be assessed on the kickoff. How are we going to handle that? Is it still going to be fourth and 15? Are we just moving the line of scrimmage? Um, or are we going to take yardage off of that if the scoring team had a foul committed against them? If B committed the foul on A score, um, are we going to are we going to make it less than fourth and 15 or are we just going to move the line of scrimmage? And ultimately that's what we decided to do to keep it fourth and 15. It was always a fourth and 15 play, but we're going to move the line of scrimmage. If there was a personal foul on the scoring play, either if, if, if and if a committed a personal foul, say it was on sportsmanlike conduct on a, they would get moved back. Um, you have to, so you have to think about penalty enforcement. You have to think about um, when the kicking team that elects to go for that, um, fourth and 15 play, when can they change their mind um, or can they change their mind? So there's a lot of unintended consequences with it. So we fine tuned it. We got a lot of support. We got a lot of good feedback on it. It didn't get voted down. It got tabled. Um, so 
that um, suggest to me that there was enough people interested in it that they want to look at it further. So I think that um, some people viewed it as a little gimmicky and that it wasn't consistent with the game and the way the game is played. I hear those concerns. I think it's also the other flip side of it is that it's a very exciting and um, it'll be a very angst filled and tense filled moment when yeah. that team gets the ball one play and you got to have it. Um, yeah, so. I, I love it. And, and coaches have to make decisions. It adds more decision making intrigue to the coaches during the course of the game. I love that. Yeah, and by the way, we decided that we thought that it was more interesting that it wasn't only for the team that was trailing, because I think one of the arguments was, why should you reward, why does that team that's trailing, that team's played lousy all game, now we get into the fourth quarter and they don't have to kick off again. They score and they don't have to kick off again. Why should they be rewarded? Well, that's why we made it for that either team, whether you're trailing or leading, could do it. If a team's up two touchdowns and they want to take possession of the ball and they want to go and they want to roll the dice on that, I think that's exciting too. I think that is, so you want to try to make it, you you want to try to find equalizers in it. So that's why, you know, you could not only did it, could it create closer games, it could also have the reverse effect and the unintended consequences in some ways of creating blowouts because the team that's up, that team that's up three scores feels like they're playing with house money and they can go for it. And, you know, or the team can, the team that's down big can start the third quarter off with it. Um, that's instead of kicking off. So there's a lot of different ways to think about it. Um, I think it's interesting, the, the feedback we got. So we'll go back and we'll look at it and we'll continue to fine tune it. And we'll see, you know, if other clubs want to partner with us on it and, and look at it again. So it, it's interesting though. How about when, when will that next be revisited, John? So that's completely out for 2020. What's the next time that the owner and the owners in the competition committee would look at that? That would be, it would be next year. It'd be next February at the combine. We would start to look at it again. Okay. Um, very good. Then the one, I guess the one kind of continuing, you mentioned it earlier, the pass interference, uh, pass interference review system. Where does the NFL stand with that right now? So pass interference review was approved last year for one year only 2019 season. And that expired. It was not put back up for a vote. You know, oftentimes, for the people don't know, for votes to pass, you need to have 75% or 24 votes. So the vote has to be at a minimum 24 to 8 to get, a, to get something passed and approved. So when the competition committee, who has nine members, has no support for something, you're already zero for nine. So you know coming out of competition committee discussions whether things can pass or not. So we had another rule proposal up about blindside blocks, which I won't get into now, but uh, – and – it was um, it was 09 coming out of competition committee. We knew it didn't have a chance to have legs, so we withdrew the proposal. We'll go back to the drawing board and look at it again, maybe for next year. But and, um, and we'll talk about that when we talk about the points of emphasis. But you know, so you know, coming out if you're going to pass interference was 09 coming 09 to put it back up for a permanent vote from the competition committee. So it it had no legs coming out of that. So it wasn't going to get approved. Um, so. As you know, so it's so it's done. So pass interference review was a one year only. I think most people had a lot of frustration with it. We certainly had frustration with it. We think they struggled. It was it was a flawed concept uh, on arrival in a lot of ways. Um, it's very hard to when you're looking at a catch, when you're looking at two feet are inbounds. If you're looking at the ball that's crossed the plane, those are objective standards. Is the player in bounds? Does he have control with two feet? Is he crossed the goal line? Objective. That's what replay has been. Now you're adding, is that player significantly hindered? Because one thing you got to remember about pass interference, Dave, it's not, you're allowed to hinder the player. You're allowed to make incidental contact. You have to significantly hinder your opponent in order, while the ball's in the air, out of the quarterback's hands, for it to be pass interference. So you, so you start applying a very subjective standard of significant hindrance and it's going to be you're going to be all over the place plus i don't know that the league had the the standard had been set from the clubs for what they wanted so i think it was a reaction to the new orleans uh rams nfc championship game there was a lot of frustration coming out of that there was a feeling and i think rightly so of we need to be able to correct egregious errors this is where we landed and we were on faulty ground to begin with. So it's gone. 
John, points of emphasis for the 2020 season. Start with, run it down with me uh, as you wish. So we talk about the rule changes, and every year coming out of the competition committee meetings, coming out of the offici- meetings that the officials have, we talk about having points of emphasis in place. So that is, they're not formal rule changes, but they are ways that we want to look at. We're not changing language of rules. We're not changing um, the, the purpose of the rule, but we are looking at how we officiate it uh, and how we treat that rule. So, and oftentimes what you find is the player safety fouls, we look at, they look at the, the competition committee, the officiating department looks at safety data, and a lot of times the rules, the points of emphasis are, 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 are designed to maximize player safety. And the first one, the use of helmet is the first use of helmet now is going to be in its third year. And the use of helmet is hard to get on the field. Uh, sometimes the games play fast and players lower their head. They get their shoulder, they get their head across their opponent and make contact with the shoulder. But from an official's vantage point, he sees that head go down. He sees contact made and maybe a foul a flag comes out for, for use of helmet, which is lowering the helmet and making contact at any part of your opponent's body with any part of your helmet. Usually the crown of the helmet is how that's officiated. Um, so they are going to what they're going to the point of emphasis this year. They're going to be looking at that very closely in line play, um, both defensive and pass rushers on on tackles, um, defensive tackles on offensive guards, those kind of things. Lowering your helmet and, and initiating contact. Um, it's something we're gonna and Coach Peterson's been already been talking about that we're gonna stress. Um, but it's something that they have. They are as a player safety initiative. They are really. Um, it's really important to them to to get that out of the game, to get that he- that helmet initiate that 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 contact that's initiated with the helmet out of the game. So that's 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 the big that's a big point of emphasis in a third year. They want to fine tune that foul and get that foul right. It it makes you wonder, and don't comment because we can all get in trouble. With this, but it does make you wonder. In the playoff game against Seattle, there was a certain hit on a certain quarterback, and you wonder, man. Maybe the point of emphasis would have been exercised there. It could have been some sort of a different officiating ruling, but that's in the past. We look to the future. Can I serve my Fifth Amendment privilege? I don't know. It's, yes. I, it's actually not going to incriminate me, but I just uh, I, I, I assert my right to, to not answer that question. No, that, that, that's fine. Are there other emphasis of uh, points of emphasis for 2020? Well, the, the other one I would say uh, dovetails a little bit with what I said about our blindside block proposal. So. So, so for the fans, blindside blocks are blocks where a player is blocking back towards his own goal line, not towards the opponent's goal line, but back towards his own goal line. And for years, that was a foul blindside block. If you were heading back towards your own end line, okay, and you made contact to an opponent's head neck area, or you went low on the opponent towards his knees, that that was a foul. Well, last year they made a change. So any contact with the shoulder, forearm, or head to any part of the opponent's body, if you're going backwards, was a foul for a blindside block, if it was forcible. Okay. So I think there was, and there was some inconsistency last year with finding a level of what we were comfortable with, with forcible. I think, you know, officials, they had a change and you saw a lot of contact with the shoulder to, to, to bodies where maybe it wasn't forcible, but because of the change, that flags came out that didn't come out. So I think they want to find a standard with, uh, with those blindside blocks. And then also to apply a standard of with the blindside blocks of if I'm face up on that opponent, if I'm going parallel or back towards the line of scrimmage and I'm face up on that opponent. Okay. And I put my forearm or, or block with the shoulder, uh, what would be a perfectly legal block if we were moving upfield as opposed to backwards or parallel, do we want that as a foul? I think you'll see less of that, and I think you'll see more of what this rule change was intended to do, which was take dangerous plays out of the game where that p- player being blocked had no opportunity to defend himself. Again, this was it was changed was for a player safety initiative, and that's what it should be in for. It should be in for the dangerous plays. Um, and it should be, we, again, we talk about rule book alignment. Those blocks, when we teach players about blocking, all these player safety blocking rules should be aligned and they should be consistent and uh right blindside blocks again finding your leg you know you can talk about finding our legs with these rules after a year 
we'll see where they are in year two, but that's definitely another big point of emphasis. Yeah. John, this has been very thorough, very complete, a wonderful distraction from an extraordinarily difficult time for all of us. No anything, doubt about else, it. A- anything that I'm missing? Uh, no, I think we're in, it's going to be an interesting year. Uh, there's been a reorganization at the league office. Walt Anderson is off the field and he's, he was a, a longtime referee and he'll be, he'll be training officials, working with that, with the officials. Um, Al Riveron will still be making the, the replay decisions on game day. And then, uh, uh, longtime coach Perry Fuel will be up overseeing the day-to-day operations for the department. So it's a new, uh, it's a new regime and a new system up there. It'll be interesting to see how those guys work and, and how we all interact with them. And uh, um, Coach Peterson is always stressing with the guys to that we want to play foul-free. We want to play with limited fouls. Um, we were pretty good last year. Uh, we were def- a, a big improvement over 2018. We'll continue working on it. Um, but Coach does a great job emphasizing it to the guys. So um, we're excited. We, hopefully we'll get back in the building soon, safely. John Ferrari, Vice President of Football Operations and Compliance for the Philadelphia Eagles. Thank you so much for joining me here on the Eagles Insider Podcast. Appreciate you, Dave. Thanks, John. And we want to thank you for joining us here on the Eagles Insider Podcast, presented by Lincoln Financial Group. Thanks to Ray Doyle. Thanks to Peter Kelly. Uh, On Wednesday, we're going to have the draft picks talking about what their jersey number means to them, a special introduction on each player from Merrill Reese. And we'll take our first look at the Los Angeles Rams. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. If you have a moment to give us a review, we have the links in the uh, bio for you, so please check that out in the details. I'm Eagles Insider Dave Spadaro. Thanks, everyone, for joining us on this Eagles Insider podcast presented by Lincoln Financial Group. Be safe, be healthy, have yourselves a great Eagles day, and fly, Eagles, fly. E-A-T-L-E-S, Eagles!